first episode of La Lumination. I am Jimmy LaLumia, the leader of this soiree with the lovely Susan faber Gady as my guest today. Welcome, dear. Thank you for having me, Jimmy. She's a real hard get, but we got her. <laughs> so I think we'll keep her for a while. Oh, well, okay. Tell us what you do for a living. I'm Immediately. Pre I'm president of Chrome Orange Music Media. And in fact, a few years ago, we did an EDM remake of 96 Tears with... That's a great idea. Jimmy Lillard. Wow. Yes. Wow. It's, it's a great record. So, um, so that's what I do. I do a little teaching on the side. Okay. And um, I meet some good people that way. We have some interns here that come from that part of my life. Okay. And, and so... Music biz-wise, who are you, are you a fan of these days? These days, Billie Eilish. Okay. Uh, and Why is that? I because she, she's different. She's not. She's she doesn't fit the typical skinny twig. Um, to put it the way some of the younger crowd puts it, sex on a stick. Mm. You know what I mean? No, I haven't had that yet. You know tonight. what I mean? She's yeah. different. Her music is a little different. Her delivery is different. Her look is different. She's not concerned with jumping around on stage in a little skimpy outfit. She's just real, and that's why I like her. Right. Um, I also like Mark and I uh, discovered uh, a singer by the name who goes by the name of Aurora. Uh, she actually performed. Was it on the Grammys with? Uh, Adina Menzel. Oh, yes. yes. I did see that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So she's becoming, she's now being introduced to the mainstream, uh, quite to her surprise, in fact. Um, but I like her, again, because she's different. Mm. She dares to do things in her performance that, you know, doesn't involve choreographed moves on the stage. So you like it's the uniqueness. Real. You like yes, the I do. uniqueness, which I is really important and sort of like Now, who's this Mark that you just referred to? Oh, Mark is my, my lovely husband and partner in Chrome Orange. I think I've met him a few times. Yes, you have. At some rehearsal for a Max's Kansas, Kansas City, City yes. fundraiser. Yes. At the uh, Gibson Baldwin Show showroom. Room. Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. In what used to be the hit factory. There you go. Absolutely. Yes. And now it's Gibson and Baldwin and the upper floors are residential condos. Right. And wow. there's a nice sign outside that says live in the house that Rock built. Oh, really? Wow. I haven't so, been there since. So for those of you who don't know, we are in a very different music industry now than we were back in the days when Hit Factory was home to Michael Jackson and, you know... Uh, whoever was in town. Whoever probably, was really. in, I mean, probably everybody. On a major label. Right, every yeah. major label artist mm -hmm. recorded there. Right, so exactly. Yep. It's no longer there. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. the place where many of the hits going back decades that, you know, we and you listen to is no longer there. It's kind the of world creepy, has weird, changed. Jimmy. Well, it, it's creepy, you know? weird, and having been in the music business a bit myself for the past century. <laughs> it's not that um, long. I kind of miss it, but I kind of think it's more democratic now. It is. That you don't have to it is. gamble on getting a major to pay attention to you and then hope that you don't fall through the cracks right. when you can create your own little universe and... Um, well, look what we did with 96 Tears. Absolutely. We ended up in promo only. We were reviewed by uh, uh, Dwayne Duby. Exactly. We were, we were his pick of exactly. the week for three weeks in a row on right. Radio Info. Yep. So there's a lot that you can accomplish You're now. You're not a prisoner of this right. big... The digital age yeah. has really... You know, it, yeah. it has taken some things away. You know, we don't have the a lot of these big grandiose studios that we used to have, but we don't need them anymore. Right, exactly. Um, but we have gained promotion mm. opportunities that weren't available to us before the digital age hit. Right, right. So I actually think this is the best time to be in the music industry. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and that's what yeah. I tell my students. There is no better time. It is an absolute fallacy that the industry is almost dead and there's no money to be made. There is money to be made if you know how to do it. Well, the 
the dead part usually refers to that part of the program that we're talking about right. as being obsolete now right. because the powers that be that used to rely on that power mm -hmm. that power is just really not as powerful anymore well, and when that... a kid can sit in their bedroom right uh set everything up get a song that's suddenly getting shared all over the world and then and in the old days they were ways there were ways to get out there if you came up with an angle. And you had a great publicity master like you. And you decided one day that you were going to destroy disco. <laughs> right. <laughs> and He's and, referring, of course, to death to disco. And just sit at home churning out press releases and then suddenly winding up in Rolling Stone and the Melody Maker in the UK and Billboard magazine right. and the Daily News and on TV with Don Imus and on a budget of like $105 a week working right. at Sam Goody. Mm -hmm. There's ways for really industrious people but everybody's not tuned in that way they a majority of people need help right if you're an oddball that just lived in a room and consumed pop culture like some of us have done and you've learned all the angles and how everything works but the average artist isn't interested in that they're right. interested in just the art right the interesting thing about this era that we are we're in now with the majors is some of the smarter majors um, have discovered that there's some awesome talent coming out of the independents. And so now labels like, for instance, Universal, probably, I would say at this point, does more backing of independent labels than they do direct signings to their to label. To their own label, right. Right. Mm -hmm. And they recently, I forget what distributor, what the name of the distributor was that they, they acquired, but they acquired one of this country's largest, if not the largest, independent distributor mm. of independent music right and did that and they made an announcement via a press release on billboard that they were doing it as a furtherance of their commitment to the independent labels that they back or that they have actually partnered with right so and you know uh, a big machine which launched taylor swift mm -hmm. um eventually partnered with universal right and then uh they formed a joint venture label known as republic records right and the rest was history so there are there are many opportunities if you're tenacious and you can go out there and put yourself in the right places and meet the right people you know and and put these be put these deals together exactly you know, but there's still pitfalls as there always were as the aforementioned Taylor Swift finds herself in at this moment with uh, ownership of masters and publishing and usage and what have you so some things just never go away they right. just get bigger right and and more difficult because it's right. that it's that kind of a business it's right. well know. the age-old argument is the artist gets signed to the label the label finances the recordings the artist pays back the money that was laid out by the label to record Recoup it's Recoup called recoupment mm -hmm. recoup recouped at the rate of your royalty from sales of the music exactly yeah and these days from streams and downloads we we, we, we lump that all into sales mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so then conceivably, it would seem to flow logically that at some point, because now the, I'm the artist talking, I've actually, now once I recoup, I have actually paid for my recordings. Right. But I don't get don't to own. end up owning them. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, if I don't ever recoup, then it's reasonable that the label retains ownership because they paid for it. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay for it. And I have not caused them to, re, you know, realize a return on their investment. Right. But if I do all that and they make their money back and they realize a profit on top of it, shouldn't I get to own my recordings? And that's Taylor Swift's Right, story. exactly. And that's never been a reality, though, back in the old days. Right. It, 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 the recordings just belonged to whomever until they decided to sell them to somebody else and so on and so on and what right. have you, which is a situation I'm going through right now with an artist that I've been working with for decades, Jane County who, when she was still Wayne County, signed with Safari Records in the UK, an independent label um, that never had uh, American affiliation, which was also a problem for an artist named Toya, mm -hmm. who did very well in the UK in the early 80s, mm -hmm. but was stymied by the fact that Safari just did not seem to or want to affiliate with the US. And um, Safari recently sold 
lock, stock, and barrel to Cherry Red, another UK label affiliation that reissues. Okay. And um, in the UK or also here? In the UK. Just in the UK. In the UK. And um, Toya, in fact, who's married to Robert Fripp of King Crimson, so she's got a little bit more clout and finance available to her if need be, tried to buy back her catalog from Safari. And they refused to sell to her, even though she offered more money than Cherry Red paid for the entire Safari catalog. Now, someone online uh, said to me, they must be really crazy. Why would they not take that amount? Right. And I said, you have to think as the company thinks. Safari wanted to sign the Safari catalog. The biggest seller for Safari in their history was Toya. Okay. So the Safari catalog minus Toya becomes worth much less, less reissue, especially in the UK which is where she was successful. And that's how these games get played. Right. Because the, that's crazy. Why didn't they j just take the money? Because it's a bigger picture. Right. And they were able to sell the entire catalog instead of trying lock, stock, and barrel, piecemeal here, piecemeal there. Um, and that just recently went down. Okay. At a time when a label called Sundays, uh, which is a reissue label in America, contacted me about issuing the early Wayne County and the Electric Chairs albums. Okay. Just as I contacted Safari, uh, the gentleman who owned and ran Safari, John Craig, said, I was just about to contact you, Jimmy. We've just sold to Cherry Red. It was like, oh boy, okay. So it's all up in the air now. Wow. It's all up in the air in terms of how Cherry Red will do business. And this is what happens. This is just what happens, especially in, in a situation like this, where there's no U.S. affiliation. Right. Although there was, uh, there was some uh, period of time when someone that you know named Dave R. Okay, yes. Uh, started a label called Royalty Records with uh -huh. Doug Calvin. I remember it well. And, um, and using me as an intermediary, because I'm one of the few people that actually got along with John Craig, were able to release... Uh, Wayne County compilation, Rock and Roll Cleopatra in America. and um, But royalty no longer exists, and right. as a result, that's gone with the wind now. Right. However, whatever the nature of the deal was, I didn't get into the weeds with them that yeah. was between them. No, I didn't. But it's a sticky it. business, as we know. Mm -hmm. It is. It's an interesting business. This, this yeah. is a sticky business, mm -hmm. and you can... You can come out smelling like a rose if you know if you've got good negotiation skills and you know you know the ins and outs of this industry and you know how to navigate the people in it. Right. Um, and if you actually do your homework before you get into bed with anyone. Right. And um, got to know who you're dealing with. This is something I'm been discussing with a young man named John Wombat in the UK, okay. who has a book out on Johnny Thunders. He's doing his own self-publishing books and, and selling them on Amazon. He okay. did a book on Johnny Thunders and Brian James from The Damned, and he's now doing a Jane County book. Okay. So he's in continuous communication with me, and we're discussing the punk invasion in 1977 in England right. when Johnny Thunders from the New York Dolls and the Heartbreakers went over to England with Lee Black Childers as their manager, Mm -hmm. who was uh, David Bowie's, one of David Bowie's sidekicks during Bowie's main man period. Okay. And they signed with Track Records in the UK. Okay. Now, unfortunately, with all the hoopla and the excitement, they didn't do the homework to find out that Track was about to become insolvent. Okay. Uh, it was the label that The Who were originally on okay. in the UK. Okay. And then a deal was negotiated in America for MCA. But because the excitement of a deal, the excitement of money up front and being in the UK and the homework was not done and track went insolvent and the Heartbreakers album LAMF, which stands for like a motherfucker, for our younger audience, don't listen to that last line, um, <laughs> considered a classic landmark album of punk never saw the light of day in America during that period and thereby the Heartbreakers never got the chance to say it was our name before it was Tom Petty's name. Oh, wow. Um, which it was. I'll bet a lot of people don't know that. The reality is um, Tom Petty was in a band called Mud Crutch uh, before 
Anything oh, else? Really? Look it up. Google Mud Crutch. Mud, play, play, mud Crutch. Mud Crutch. M U D C R U T C H. Mud Crutch. They played at CBGB's in New York in 1973 or 74. Uh, okay. I at was, a time. I was a little too young to go to clubs at that point. Well, at a time. A little too young. They played uh, CBGB 74, 75. And at the time that they did that, punk in England had not broken yet. Okay. And one of the biggest bands on that newly emerging punk scene alongside the Ramones and Blondie and Wayne County and Cherry Vanilla was Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. Okay. And the Petty People and Tom himself, R.I.P., apparently seemed to like that name a lot. And they found out that John was not in the very best business hands in terms of protecting the name. Right. So Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers Took were the born. And um, Well, it's a, the, as, as a name, it's got a lot more flair than Mud Crutch. Well, exactly. But it's but it's a name that was already in usage. Now R.I.P. <laughs> yeah. Now But I gotta be honest. Thunders and the Heartbreakers continue to call themselves the Heartbreakers. And um, they were like, well, try and prove that you had there's Being a thing right. called first usage. Yes, there from is. From what I understand. Yes, there now, is. Now I brought this up to Miss County in the era of royalty records. Because Miss County went through a series of changes, starting with when she was still known as Wayne County in a band called Queen Elizabeth, and was the outrageous version of Wayne County. Mm -hmm. And then that metamorphosized into a band called Wayne County and the Backstreet Boys. And they played all over. Ah. They played all over the city. They are on the Maxis Kansas City 1976 album. Okay. With recordings as Wayne County and the Backstreet Boys. Backstreet Boys. And, um, in fact, we were included on a Rhino Records compilation okay. called The Blank Generation okay. as Wayne County and the Backstreet Boys during the royalty records period when the aforementioned Dave R. and Doug Calvin were releasing New Jane stuff and the Safari stuff. Now, during this period of time, because I write for Good Times Magazine, which I've been writing for since the dawn of time, since 1969, um, I would still peruse teen magazines because I wanted to be on top of all teen culture. Right. And one day I'm going through a teen magazine and we come across an ad that says, coming soon, the Backstreet Boys. And oh, boy. I went loony. And I called Jane and said, you've got to start using that name again. But I don't like that name, Jim. I said, I don't care if you don't like it. No, I don't like the name. I said, but you need to reclaim ownership. Right. I spoke to Doug Calvin okay. at Royalty Records. You've got to do something to engineer the fact, that you oh, that group's not going to go anywhere. Right. That group is not going to go anywhere. I'm pulling my hair out. And of course, the Backstreet Boys became I hit. huge. Yeah. And I'm sure that at any time, if they'd gone into court, as was the case with Nirvana, mm -hmm. which I had read about, that um, there was a previous Nirvana who sued and got a payday. Right. But nobody thought to do anything about it. I, I went nuts. And I didn't even know about the um, first usage thing. I found yeah. out about it yeah. while I was doing the homework because... Wayne County and the Backstreet Boys, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, they right. were not protecting, but they were by releasing the records because the records showed first usage with a time right. Right. date. The Wayne County and the Backstreet Boys Maxis was 1976. The Backstreet Boys were either busy being born or were not born yet at <laughs> yeah, that time. At that time, yeah. Um, so these are the things that a lot of people don't think about. Well, obviously, I'm feeling that listening to you, I'm feeling like the people behind the Backstreet Boys had to have known about... Not necessarily. No? Not necessarily, mm -hmm. because the Wayne County Records uh, in America, the Max's album, never got national distribution. Okay. It was distributed by Gem Records. I was pushing the hell out of it in Sam Goody's at the time, where I was a department manager in the Smith Haven Mall. Okay. And was Sam Goody's by day and Max's Kansas City by night and dedicated to all of them, including my unholy trio, the unholy trinity of Max's, which was Johnny Thunders, Jane County, and Sherry Vanilla, who signed with RCA in the UK against all warning 
because Cherry Vanilla. Cherry Vanilla, who was David Bowie's public relations lady during Main Man, during Ziggy Stardust, during the Aladdin scene, right through to Diamond Dogs. And she was his representative at RCA. Mm. And Vanilla is a very unique and very boisterous person. The RCA people wanted to skin her a lot. I'm sure. When she went to the UK, uh, there was a producer, a friend of hers, that she wanted to work with, Andrew Hoy, I think his name is. And they did a brilliant rock and roll album called Bad Girl, before Donna Summer's Bad Girls a year later. <laughs> I, lived, I lived through all of Can't this. Can't make this stuff up. I, I lived, well, there's Bad Girl and Bad Girls, that's with the plural. Close bit. enough, though. Yeah. Close enough but, for um, confusion. Exactly, and for the same subject matter, because Cherry, if you read her, autobiography called Lick Me um, could be a bad girl sometimes, uh, a lot of the time, but, um, but a good bad girl. And so um, Cherry, because she just liked the idea of being on RCA, it was Elvis's label, signed with RCA and then found out that they were not going to support her. They, the record came out, they ran some ads in the UK, they gave her a tour. Um, Ian Copeland had talked her into coming over to England when she was playing at On The Rocks, which was one of the clubs alongside Max's Kansas City and CBGB's, mm -hmm. uh, because he wanted his brother's band, The Police, to get off the ground mm -hmm. during punk. It was very hard. They needed a figure associated, and Cherry, even though she was not punk punk, she was a carryover from glam, right. as were the Heartbreakers, as was Miss County that they had transcended glam into punk because of their approach and who they were. And so she wound up with the police, two of the three, as her band, in addition to allowing them to open as the support act for the Cherry Vanilla Tour. So Sting was her bass player, you can find pictures of this online, mm -hmm. and Stuart Copeland was her drummer, accompanying Louis Lepore and Zeca Esquivel as the Cherry Vanilla Band. RCA would not release the records in America. In my Sam Goody post, I would call up, speak to international, Jorge Pinero, I think was the guy, who said, Jimmy, they don't even want to hear her name, really? let alone release the records. It was very frustrating. Um, Robert Stigwood, who was a very distinguished record owner, label owner, uh, RSL Productions with the, the Bee Gees and films, mm -hmm. uh, such as Saturday Night Fever, offered to buy the initial single, The Punk. Okay. I want to rock and roll, I want to be a punk. It was a great catchy pop punk, punk pop, before such a thing existed because then that became power punk or pop punk. Right. Cherry was doing that before it was fashionable. Okay. Stigwood made them a tremendous offer. RCA said, no thanks. That's how severe they were. So this is the point I'm making. Okay. All three of my faves, the Heartbreakers with signing with Track, Jane signing with Safari, and Vanilla signing with RCA, you have to do the homework, people, yeah. and you have to deal with the people politics, whether it's you made enemies at a label, you don't sign with the label. Right. Do the homework. If you find out a label's about to go insolvent or go broke, you don't, don't sign, sign with them. them. Yeah. There a label some... doesn't have U.S. affiliation, and that's where your home base is. Don't sign with a label that doesn't have. Uh, and that's all from things that I was personally right. interacting There's with There's a lot involved. that goes yeah. into, from an artist's perspective, choosing a label to sign with. Mm -hmm. And then from the label's perspective, there's an equal amount of work that goes into deciding uh, whether or not you're going to sign an artist. And I think that should be our second episode. Well, it probably will be. Okay. And also back in the day, because everything was someone could get themselves off the ground just by sending press releases from their bedroom in Rokonkoma. Right. That's changed now. It was more interpersonal interaction and that's how people made enemies and that's how very, <laughs> it is. It, now it's all computer and you don't it even is, meet anybody. So it's, it's less likely that you're going to have a label. Really. Yeah, it's less likely that a label's going to hate you so much that they're not going to release a record that could sell. And that's right. what, that's, you know. Well, anyway. It seems like our time is up, as that Mark character <laughs> just kind of indicated 
to us about four minutes ago we got the queue. that we have five minutes left. In the UK, a queue, by the way, is a line in the side. So hopefully you're all forming a line for this broadcast of La Illumination with my special guest today, the fabulous Susan faber Gady and her husband Mark Gady at the control. Um, and uh, we'll chat with you again next time. Let us know what you're interested in hearing about and how fabulous you are. <laughs> and follow us on social media. Exactly. And some me anti social media. So. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. You're welcome, my dear. Fabulous. Ninety-six tears Ninety-six tears